Okay, that should be us now. Uh, okay, hello everybody. Um, I'm Alison Cowan from Imperial College London, uh, and I'll be talking to you about some recent work in collaboration with the co-authors listed and the institutes listed, and I'm going to be talking to you about trying to further our understanding of the grain size dependence of peritite magnetic particles using micromagnetic modeling, which is Merrill. So uh, yeah, I'm sure you all know what peritite is. It's an iron sulfide and depending on the ratio between the iron and the sulfur, you can get a range of compositions and crystal symmetries. And peritite is a mineral that's of interest to a vast range of uh, disciplines, including material science, uh, planetary scientists and geophysicists. Um, and this is because it's found in the Earth's crust and also extraterrestrial samples such as meteorites. But today I'll be focusing on the monoclinic peritite, which is Fe7S8. And this is considered to be the most significant paleomagnetic peritite type. And this is because it's very magnetic at ambient temperatures and it can significantly contribute to the remnant magnetization in its host rocks. So the understanding of the micromagnetic side of this is important. So previous studies are uh, mainly experimental and it's been bulk magnetic measurements looking at things like a uh, coercivity with grain size and temperature. Uh, and second to that, there have been studies, um, although there's been yeah, one study by a, a man called Sotful, and this was about 40 years ago, and he did some bitter pattern imaging uh, to get the domain structure. And you can see here that it's worked actually really well. Um, and it's a really simple configuration of parallel domains with 180 domain walls. Uh, but what's a uh, interesting is that all the experimental in this imaging has been carried out on samples that are usually about 1.5 microns or larger. So there's this big gap um, that we don't know a uh, how peritype behaves at the sub-micron level. Uh, so Sofal, with his study with the bitter pattern imaging, uh, estimated that the single domain to the multi-domain transition occurred about 1.6. So we are looking to do the first micromagnetic study of peritite and really focus in on this gap of the knowledge that is that sub micron level. So how we've done that, we've used this value that uh, Sofal estimated, which is the 1.6 microns, which is the single domain to multi-domain transition. And we've used this to approximate the exchange stiffness constant that we need to run in Merrill. Uh, Merrill, we've also updated the, the code to make it for monoclinic peritides. So we've used the equation here for the magnetocrystalline anisotropy. Uh, so we've, we're all set up, we're ready to go. So what do we actually want to do? Well, we've based our simulation models on some SEM images. Uh, there's a nice example here, which shows that peritide is, uh, takes a hexagonal prism form. Uh, so we've used this as the basis for our meshing to run into Merrill, and this is about a five to one height to diameter uh, ratio. I, I should probably note that for the future slides when I'm referring to the grain size, I'm actually referring to the equivalent cube volume diameter. It's not the diameter of the hexagonal prism. So in the next few slides, we're going to look at Remnant state domain characterization. We're going to look at the nudged elastic band modeling for a relaxation times and recording stability. And lastly, we're going to look at the simulated magnetic hysteresis and fork diagrams. Okay, so first up, the remnant domain state. So we've looked at sizes in the range of 10 nanometers to one micron. And this is from a randomized starting state. Uh, in terms of the uh, directionality of uh, the magnetization here, uh, the easy axis lies along the uh, said plane in the X direction and a very hard out of plane uh, from the said axes. So for the small paratite grains, which is less than 20, what we're seeing is it's always single domain behavior along this easy axis direction. And as we increase the grain size to above 20, then we can get single domain or multi-domain depending on the minimization. 
obviously, as we increase the grain size, uh, the, <laughs> the multi-domain uh, results are more frequent. And we're also seeing increasingly more complex shapes. So for example, the 300 nanometers there is the, your uh, parallel three domain shape. And then the one micron is significantly more complex. But what's interesting here is if we compare to um, results from magnetite, where you would see this non-uniform vortex shape start to uh, arrive at these kind of uh, grain sizes, we don't see this for peritite. And we're putting this down to the uh, dominant magnetocrystalline anisotropy keeps the magnetization uh, constrained within this said plane. Uh, so it almost acts like a uniaxial uh, anisotropy. And we see this again if we look a bit closer at the multi domain solutions. And we could see that the domain walls are neal walls, which means that it's the rotation of the magnetization within the plane which is unusual because at these kind of particle sizes, we would probably expect it to be an out of plane block wall. So uh, it suggested that the strong inherent in plane anisotropy uh, of this prevents the domain wall from pointing out of plane. So in this case, the Neal wall is more energetically favorable. So we've tried to quantify this, uh, the remnancy of results just to get the transition. Uh, we've done this pretty simply. We've just ran a number of uh, remnant state simulations for each grain size. Uh, in this case, 10 from 300 uh, in steps of 10 nanometers. And we have assumed that the particle is multi-domain, mainly multi-domain if over 50% of uh, these outputs are multi-domain solutions. So what we've done is we've defined a rough estimate estimate of the single domain to multi-domain transition. And this is from 160 nanometers. A, and then at 250 nanometers, all remnant states are multi-domain. So we've got a better idea of what the single domain to multi-domain transition is uh, from a randomized starting state. So next was to look at the recording stability, which is your nudged elastic band algorithm. And this help us cal calculate the energy barriers between two lowest energy minimum states. So I've got two examples here. So the top is 15 nanometers and the bottom is a 40 nanometer particle. And what we're seeing is two different processes here. So the top one is just your coherent rotation of the magnetization within the plane. A, and we're seeing quite a small energy barrier here, which uh, results in a relaxation time of 53 seconds, which is obviously very small. If we compare this to our 40 nanometer particle, we're seeing a different process where it's uh, the formation of your Neal wall that sweeps through as the magnetization direction is switched. What we're seeing here is quite a big jump. Uh, the energy barrier is significantly larger and the relaxation time has now jumped to 10 to the 90 years, which is a huge jump from a difference of 25 nanometer uh, particles. If we look at this properly, uh, all the results from a range of 10 to 200 nanometers, uh, we can see that the outputs of uh, the relaxation times are huge. Um, for comparison, I've put the blue line refers to the age of the solar system. Uh, and we can see that the majority of these particles uh, are over and beyond that and exceed uh, geological time scales. And if we compare, for example, the 20 nanometer uh, particle has a 10 to the seven relaxation time. Magnetite at a similar grain size would be in its super paramagnetic region. So there's a huge difference between other uh, recording minerals. Uh, what we've also been able to do is look at the super paramagnetic threshold. And we've just uh, determined that as when the relaxation time is less than 60 seconds. Um, and we're getting this to be 15 nanometers. We've also looked at this theoretically and that also came out of 15 nanometers. So we're pretty confident that that is correct. A, and that's a value that hasn't been determined before for monoclinic paratite. Okay, and lastly, we did some fork analysis. Roberto's uh, gone through 
forks, um, which is helpful. Um, and what we find here is quite interesting. So the left hand column is for um, 100 nanometer particles, the right is for a micron, and that's just the comparison of the two. So what we're seeing is the hysteresis data um, indicates that the peritide has a high coercivity, and this is upwards of 300 millitesla, which is pretty high. Unfortunately, we don't, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have a direct comparison with experimental work because that's not been carried out a, on particles this size, but generally the coercivity of peritite is much higher than on other minerals. So this does follow the right trend. I, when we look at the, the processes of this hysteresis and the forks, it's dominated by the coherent rotation of the magnetization. And when we uh, take out the magnetic ratios, it makes for a not so interesting day plot in that all the points are uh, within the single domain region. So we're putting this down to the strong inherent K1 anisotropy term, which uh, allows peritite to maintain the single domain behavior even at grain sizes up to a micron. We are seeing a slight reduction in the MRS, MS, and an increase in the BCR, BC, with increasing grain size, but this isn't that much. But it does indicate that the domain shape is uh, shifting from a pure single domain to maybe more of a flowering state. But again, this variation is very small. Ideally, we would want to um, keep working at this. Um, to grain sizes maybe up to two microns but unfortunately we are limited in terms of um, computing capabilities um, but maybe that's something we can do in the future um, to kind of build a broader picture and maybe try and get that push towards the uh, PSD or the multi-domain region. Okay so in summary I this is the first micromagnetic model of monoclinic paratite and we're looking at a range that hasn't been investigated experimentally. I, we started by looking at the single domain to multi-domain transition, which occurs at 160 nanometers from a randomized starting state. The relaxation times associated with peritite are super large, a two to three orders of magnitude larger than what we've seen in other minerals, such as magnetite. We have estimated the superpower magnetic region to be about 15 nanometers, the coercivity measurements from the hysteresis and fork data are high, 300 millitesla, but that makes sense when we look at the experimental literature. And the fork diagrams confirm single domain behavior, and this is because of the super high first anisotropy constant, which keeps the, a, the magnetization within plane. And these results are in agreement with Sofal, who I mentioned at the start, who estimated the peritite would have single domain behavior up until 1.6 microns, which is why it would be really interesting to continue this work and push it over and above, above the 1.6 to see if that is correct. Yeah, so that's me. If anyone has any questions, um, that would be great. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. We do have one question in the chat, um, which says, the formation of domain walls relates to demagnetizing energy that is proportional to saturation magnetization. In this form of pyrotite that you have, have you measured the saturation magnetization in your pyrotite samples? How would this value influence your MDSD measurements? Um, yes, yeah, so the saturation magnetization is a parameter that we've put into a Merrill. I, I don't know off the top of my head what the values are. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it is measured, but I, I cannot remember <laughs> is my answer. I'm sorry, I can't um, aid you further. So perhaps I can answer that, Alison, because that's just a, it's just a standard value that's taken from from David Dunlop's and Uston's book. So that's where it comes from. That helps. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same value for yeah all the samples. Yeah. 
All right, Richard, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, nice. Interesting. Um, I'm just ask a question about the the difference between your second conclusion here, which is the transition to multi-domain occurs at 160 nanometers, and your, your final conclusion, which is that single domain particles remain stable up to yes. one micrometer. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, is that is that because I mean, what are you calling multi-domain? Is it is it the state you obtain from a random starting configuration, which then minimizes? Yeah. So, so the this question is, is that. Yeah, you've yeah you've made a good point. That's the discrepancy, in that we're separating what is a randomized starting state, a so like your spontaneous magnetization, rather than when you have a field applied and what happens in that process. So there is a difference between the randomized starting state and then something that's a typical field applied hysteresis behavior, in that the hysteresis yeah. once the field is applied, it's very hard to stop it from being within that magnetization plane. But I'm just wondering whether, I mean, can you really call it, is it, a, is it a true MD state when you do it that way? Because it looks like it's it's at the maximum of your of your nudged, your nudged elastic band have a maximum, right? And so the MD state is actually not a, a minimum. It's just, it converges into an MD state and, it, and sort of the simulation stops, but actually the minute you get rid of those domain walls, they don't come back unless you... Yes, so that, yeah. yes, you are you are correct, yeah. There is a discrepancy with that. I would say the, uh, the, the fork diagrams are a true representation of when you would get the multi-domain state. And that's right. why it agrees with Sulfur with the 1.6, that makes, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, makes sense, thanks. Oh, and the second question follow up if I can. Um, how well known is the, the exchange constant for pyrotite? Uh, is, that, is that measured or? So the exchange constant is not measured. So we have estimated that. And that's why I think we're probably the first people to model pyrotite because it's not um, experimentally known. So yeah, we have estimated that. Uh, using Sawfall's 1.6 um, okay. critical what, what, size. What value comes out? What, what value compared to magnetite? Is it like half the value? Or? I, oh, I don't know off the top of my head, yeah, but I, I, can I can tell you in the <laughs> chat in a minute. Yeah, okay. yeah, don't worry. <laughs> Thanks. We have one more question just in the chat, um, which says, when you model the reversal of a moment and estimate the coercivity of a particle, is the field applied in the easy plane? Have you explored varying this angle between the field and the easy plane? Yeah, so the field is applied in the, the X, the easy plane. I know that's something that we've not looked at. I, well, obviously with the fork, it's a, it's a range of, um, of fields that are applied, but exclusively down the hard axis, no, that's not something we've done. Um, but that yeah, that's something we could easily look at yeah but other than the forks everything is along the easy axis yeah the easy plane <laughs>